series all church campaign on the mercy, on showing mercy to each other, and again, the miracle of mercy. And so, you know, since we're talking about families today, it does remind me of a very troubled family. In fact, there was a phone call to the police about a, a disturbance in the household. The police officer ran over and he called back to the station and said, yeah, we kind of have a problem. He said, well, what's the problem? He said, well, well, what happened is, is, you know, the woman, woman shot her husband. He said, oh, that's terrible. Well, she shot her husband because he walked on the wet floor. He said, well, have you arrested her yet? Are you kidding? The floor's still wet. Okay. Just a little family joke there. See, isn't this the way families are? Sometimes we get on each other's nerves. We do things that drive each other crazy. And uh, there are times that the worst, the treatment that we give to people in the world are people that are family members, right? We treat them poorly. We treat them with, with, with disrespect. We say very rude things to them because we think they're just going to take and still be there tomorrow. But of all people, the biggest test for us is how do we treat the loved ones and family that are around us? Because it truly is indicative of our relationship with God. Remember, God has loved you. We are called to love each other. And so today's lesson from the book of 1 Corinthians is all about a faith family in the city of Corinth. And in this faith family in the city of Corinth, they hated each other. They were fighting each other. In fact, they had exactly what we're going to do in just a moment, going downstairs to have this potluck supper. They would have a potluck supper on almost every single evening. And what would happen is the very rich people would bring their shrimp and their caviar and their steak, and the poor people would bring maybe some grains and some corn or whatever it is they had to share. And what would happen is the rich people thought they somehow had the right to be first in line. The rich people would all eat the shrimp and the caviar and the steaks. There'd be nothing left for the poor people. And Paul says, this is not how we are supposed to live our lives as Christians. We are called to care for each other. The poor people need to be treated the same way the rich people are. He said, shame on you. He said, and then of course he had those famous words in the institution of the Lord's Supper. When you gather together, you are supposed to be one in Jesus Christ. And so this lesson for today is really about a troubled family that was wrestling with each other, struggling with each other, and really intolerant of each other. And Paul says... There are a list of things that we should do if we were to have mercy on each other the way God's had mercy on us. And so one of the things that he says, I'm just going to highlight four of them today, because there's so many different words that he says about how we should treat our family members. The very first thing he says is, be kind to one another. Be kind. It seems like a given. When people get married for the very first time, they have all the attention in the world because they're in love. They're just going to love each other and care for each other the rest of life. You know as well as I do that doesn't always happen. Pretty soon that magic goes away and we become intolerant of each other. But God says that we are to be kind because God has been kind to us. Kindness ultimately makes us attractive to each other. You want to be attractive to your spouse? Be kind to your spouse. Write her a cute little note in the morning and say, oh, I love you. I'm going to miss you today. I know it's been 30 years since you've been married. 40 years. You haven't done that since you were a kid's day. Well, it's never too late to start. Can you imagine how it will brighten your spouse's day just to be kind to them and remind them, I love you. Kindness is attractive. Kindness ultimately makes others want to be kind to us. You see, we're like, well, you know, my spouse doesn't treat me really well, so why would I say that to them? It's not about how your spouse treats you. It's about how you treat your spouse. How do you treat your family members? Because I can't control how other people can, uh, treat me, but I can control how I treat them. I know, sometimes we say, they're not kind to me. So what I'm asking you to do, if that's your first response, you know, they're not kind to me. When they're kind to me, I'll be kind to them. I've got two words for you. Grow up. Yes, put that in your bulletin. Grow up, okay? Who's the mature person here? Grow up. This is not about how they respond to me. This is how I respond to them. Now, again, I'm not talking about in extreme cases where there's abuse. You do not have to tolerate being abused by people who treat you poorly. 
But most families, I'm talking about most families, just be kind to each other. Don't say cutting words. Leave those little life notes of kindness. Paul says again in the book of 1 Thessalonians, don't be hateful to people just because they're hateful to you. Be good to each other and to everyone else. You can turn over the next page. And then he goes on and says that we are to appropriately use our anger. Now I told you there are appropriate uses of anger. Because anger is a God-given gift to protect us from those who mean to do us harm. And there's nothing wrong with using anger to protect yourself. Now I'll tell you a story. Most of you know the story about how my stepfather, my mom remarried, my stepfather, he kind of did what he had to do to win my mom over. On the very first day back in the home, after they got married and got back from their honeymoon, we were having a dinner, inviting some friends over, and uh, I tell you, what happened is, is I, 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 I helped mow the lawn, but I didn't sweep the sidewalk. I got thrown through a plate glass window for being so rude and inconsiderate for not cleaning up the grass on the sidewalk. I was a 10, 11 year old boy. Nobody told me I had to do it. I just didn't think about it. So this was my life. But I'm not saying it for you to feel bad for me. What I am telling you is how God meant me to use my anger. Skip forward to 20 years later, I have a little girl named Carissa. She's now about five or six years of age. It's the first time that she's seen my stepfather because my stepfather's never made the effort because I'm in Oklahoma. What do I do? I'm not bitter about how my stepfather treated me, but I will tell you this. I will not allow him to touch and hurt my daughter. And so I took him aside and I said, you will not ever be near my daughter in my time here because you don't have the right to treat her the way you treat me. That is, an, is appropriately using anger to protect yourself and to protect the people that we love. You do not have to allow yourself or those whom you love to be treated poorly by somebody in your family. So what anger does, anger, as I said, is a God-given gift to protect yourself from those who mean you harm. It delineates the borders around your core values. It tells you what's important. When people uh, step on your turf, all of a sudden you get angry. And rightfully so, you should. You should be able to protect yourself in your turf. You don't have to allow people to trample on that. God doesn't expect us to do that. Jesus got upset. Can somebody remind me of when uh, Jesus got upset and he showed him getting really angry when his core values were violated and got really angry about it? Well, no, here, I'm thinking about the temple. Do you remember that story? Jesus was so angry with how they were selling goods and making a profit in the temple of God. Jesus got so angry because this was God's space that he turned over the temples and kicked out all the bums who were making a profit at the temple. He said, this is not appropriate use of my father's house. That was his core value. You do not use my father's house to make a profit. Jesus was angry for a reason. There's nothing wrong with being angry. We get upset when people threaten our core values, and that's okay to use anger to protect ourselves. However, Maybe you're angry all the time. That's another story, isn't it? You know, it reminds me. <laughs> and well, what happens is we start getting upset about everything. You know, people are always upset about everything. Everything's an offense. Everything causes an offense. If so, you might need to look at your own life and say, maybe I'm protecting values that are really not important. Okay? We may be imposing our values upon others and rather than protect your own values, and in that case, we might actually become the bull. It reminds me, this is kind of a cute little story. I remember when I first came here, uh, we had the women, we had a big group of women in our altar guild, and they would always make knuckles for Christmas, and they were just fantastic. But I will tell you, my very first Christmas here, I went downstairs to see how the knuckles were being made because they invited me over. And I walked in the kitchen, and you would swear World War III was going to break out because women were arguing about whose knuckle recipe we were going to use, and would you know, mine's the right one and yours the wrong one. I just kind of backed out of the kitchen, let them go, right? Get out of the way when women are arguing about knuckles, okay? 
These are values that aren't really ultimately important. Who's number one here? By the way, <clears throat> I hate to say I did have a favorite gone. That's, I'm not going to say that because I don't want to get in trouble. I did, yes, keep it quiet. By the way, if you think it's yours, you're right. <laughs> I used to get like 20 different nut rolls for, for, for Christmas, and I would always put them out for Christmas dinners, except for the one I really liked and saved it for myself. And it was yours. Okay. Love is not irritable. It's not easily angry. Anger is not a problem. But make sure when you're getting angry, it's about values that are truly important. Number three, Paul says, let go of your past hurts, the hurts that have been perpetrated against you. If you are still chewing on those stories of what happened to you a year ago, you may be better and might need to find a way to let that go. If you're still chewing on stories of slights that people perpetrated against you five years ago, you're definitely better, okay? We've got to find a way to let this bitterness and this resentment go. We need to stop rehearsing past wounds that people perpetrated against us. They did it years ago. It's gone. It's in our past. Let it go. Because rehearsing it will constantly tell yourself, remind yourself the story of what that person did to you only leads to a thing called resentment. And I'm telling you, resentment doesn't hurt the person with whom you're angry. Guess who it hurts? Yourself and the family that you love. So I am telling you, if you're resentful about a person who's no longer in your life and you still keep rehearsing those wounds about how they hurt you and perpetrated that against you, it's harming your children, your spouse, the people that you care for, your friends, why? Because every time they come around, you're angry about something. And it's taking a toll on them. Resentment harms the ones we love, not the person with whom we're angry. We need to let go of that anger. Oh, and there's a, there's a kissing cousin to this. Not only rehearse things that happen to us, are you the type of person that starts thinking about what will happen to you? When you meet that person next, and you start thinking about, oh, they're going to, well, I can't, I'm going to go up and they're going to treat me this way, and they're going to say that to me. And so what you do is you start creating drama in your mind of things that haven't even happened, and may never happen, of what a person might do towards you. Maybe you're bitter, and you need to let that go. If you ever, I'm telling you, I have done that. When I've had to go and confront somebody about a difficult thing, I start running all the scenarios in my brain. And I start dreaming about all these confrontations that I'm going to have with that person. Oh, they're going to say this, and they're going to say that, and they're going to say that, and then I start getting really angry about it, right? And I just get myself so worked up. And then you go up and talk to them, and nothing happens. Right? 99% of the time, isn't that true? No, it does happen sometimes, there's drama. But stop creating drama in your brain, okay? Let go of the hurts that have been perpetrated against you, Paul says. And then number four, this is so important because this is such a hopeful thing. Always believe that God is working in the life of your family. Always believe it. I know your family doesn't do what you want them to do. They don't go to church anymore. They haven't done the things. They're not coming over for Easter dinner. They ignore you on this event. They ignore you there. They just feel like you've been abandoned. And I know, I do feel bad for you. It's hard. But you need to trust that God has not let go of them. There are God's here. Placement God's here. You don't have to be a nag about it. You don't have to come, hey, you should be in church. You should be my. You know what that does? It just drives them further away. Just love them. And pray for them. And trust that they are in God's care. About 10 years ago, I had a woman who came up to me. And uh, she had four kids. And they're all grown right now. And she said, none of my church kids go to church. And none of my kids have a relationship or a close relationship. And what am I supposed to do? I said, just pray for them and trust that they're in God's care. It's been 10 years. Guess what? Three of them. Now I have a relationship with God again. They just, they went through the rebellion and I, she prayed for them. She loved them. I said, just back off. Don't push them. 
Just every time you see them, you get the opportunity, just love them. They're all involved with their life right now. Three or four of them are now directly involved in the congregation somewhere, and their relationship with God is very important to them. Because you just back off and just love them for Christ's sake. I'm not saying that's going to be a result if you do that. I'm not promising you that. Because some kids just stay away. But I am promising you this. God is relentless in His mercy and love. Remember what we said last week? For those who are lost. Because He wants to find them. So I'm asking you to just trust God with your loved ones with whom you've got a broken relationship, who may not have the relationship with God you expect. God loves them more than you could possibly ever imagine loving them yourselves. Place them in God's care. And so I'm inviting you this week to practice mercy. Yes, I'm asking, I'm serious. Can you imagine for those who are not here with your spouses this week? Just go home and do this, I'm telling you, do this. Write a note, I love you, honey and put it on the kitchen door for your spouse. When they open up the door, they're going to see that. Or when they get up in the morning, put it on the mirror or something like that. So when they uh, look at the mirror on, on, in the morning, they're not just seeing their face. They're seeing a nice, cute little message from you. Do pack your, your kid's lunch, your grandchildren's kid's lunch, and put a little note in there. Just thinking of you. hope you're having a good day. Try to practice mercy with your family members this week. You will be amazed. If you are struggling right now in your family, and your family life is filled with heartache, if you treat your family with mercy, you will be amazed at how merciful your family will become to you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you've called us to practice gifts of mercy, not only to this world, but also to our family. But yet we are sometimes the least merciful to the very people that we are called to love the most. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help us be merciful this week. We pray that all those resentments that have built up through life, you would help us to forgive, to let go. All of those things that would be barriers between us, God. Let us remember how merciful you've been to us. And let us practice that same mercy to our family. I know our families are for us. But you know they are also there to love us and support us. So let us practice mercy this week in our families. Let us be the source of God's love. And let our families become merciful, kind, and good, compassionate families again. But we've got to take the first step. We can't wait for somebody else. So use us, God, this week as messenger of your mercy. For he asks us in Jesus' name. Amen. We invite you to stand at this time and let us sing together our congregation.